we know that a junior doctor who's worked a 30 hour shift will make 460% more diagnostic errors in the intensive care unit. If your surgeon has only slept six hours in the night before they perform the surgery on you, you have a 170% increased risk of a major surgical error, such as sort of um, organ hemorrhaging or vascular damage. And then what's sad as well is that young doctors can become part of that statistic. Because what we've discovered is that after working a 30 hour shift, when a doctor goes back into their car to drive home at the end of that shift, they are 168% more likely to get into a car accident and then be back in the emergency room from which they just came, but now as a patient rather than doctor. This is lunacy. You know, well, what is with this culture of doctors staying up all hours? I mean, I thought I remember a few years ago, even in the States, where they finally said to like long haul truck drivers, like this isn't happening. You had guys out there going 20 hour shifts, 30 hour shifts to make the money and what, you know, but I think it was actually, okay, legally you cannot do this. You cannot yeah. do this. Why of all places in the herald halls of our medical industry are people pushing the limit? Do ask? no harm is the promise that you make. Um, I mean, and these, these people are taking care of your family and yeah. your, you know. And these are good, and by the way, I'm not trying to sleep shame, you know, medicine or any individual, you know, doctors are, do wonderful things, nurses, the whole staff, I, I am so admiring of the work that they do. But they it's look the tired. the system <laughs> that, that is imposing this right. great sleep depression on them. Um, and you're right, you know, you look at truckers, transportation, you look at aviation, you know, all of these things now have policies in place. You know, why isn't there that same policy in medicine for sleep? Um, and part of it is perhaps due to sort of a slight, maybe in an old boys network that we went through it, you should go through it too. It's a hazing, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it's this macho idea. And that's just hubris to think that through years of training on the job that you can do away with something that mother nature took 3.6 million years to put in place is arrogance and it costs lives. We know that one out of every 20 junior doctors will kill a patient due to a fatigue related error. So there are lives being lost to insufficient sleep. Um, and also, by the way, it works for the patient too. The, the place that you need the benefit of sleep most is probably the place where you will least get a decent night of sleep, which is on a hospital ward. Think about the neonatal intensive care unit. We used to leave lights blazing. Now, you know, we've done studies where we've looked at regularizing light in the neonatal intensive care unit. As a consequence, they have more structured wake sleep cycles they have about a 50 to 60% increase in their oxygen saturation. They have faster weight gain and they exit the neonatal intensive care unit five weeks earlier. It's sleep. You know, why don't we do this in hospital wards for adults? You know, on a long haul flight, you and I will probably get given a face mask and earplugs. Basic necessity probably costs less than a pound, less than a dollar. Why don't we do that in all hospitals? Even that could help. But to come back to your initial question also, where does that maniacal junior doctor sort of medical resident training program come from? And it's a fascinating and a sad story. The original residency program in the United States began at John, uh, John Hopkins University. Um, and it was started by a surgeon called William Holstead. What year was that? Uh, that? This was back in the 1920s and 30s when they okay. were starting to establish it and they brought him in. And at the time he was doing revolutionary work on anal, uh, an anesthetic agents and analgesia for surgery. Okay. And one of the things that they were looking at was actually cocaine. And it turns out that cocaine is a local nerve blocking agent. So if someone has taken cocaine, if they snorted cocaine, often their nose and face will go numb. And the reason is because cocaine, like lidocaine, is a nerve numbing agent. So he was studying the actions of this drug and his name was William Holstead. And he started to dabble in his own supply and tragically he became a cocaine addict. But then he started the medical residency program as a cocaine addict. And he was known for pulling these heroic long shifts. They could go for like two or three days straight, awake all the time. And people just thought he was spectacular, that this man just was superhuman. He didn't need sleep. No one knew about his dirty habit. 
But the problem was that he then designed the medical residency program in the mold of his own cocaine habit behavior, which was sustained wakefulness. And so he demanded that people lived at the hospital. That's why it's called a residency. You live as a resident. And he required his young trainee doctors to stay awake as long as he could. And, and it turns out that you know, he started to understand his habit. And I write all about this story in the book. He sought help, he knew he had a problem. He then went to a clinic that would try to get him off the cocaine. And part of the way, part of the treatment problem to deal with going cold turkey was that they would give him morphine to try and help with the pain. He came out of that program, not only having not kicked his cocaine habit, but now he had a heroin addiction as well. So it's the story of an accidental addict, but we still hold that maniacal, inhumane practice of training our doctors to extreme degrees um, with terrible patient and doctor consequences.